Welcome everybody to uh, our CSIS Shoal Chair session, session on uh, a new book, The Six Phases of Globalization. And for those of you that haven't seen it, here it is. I'll probably hold it up again later on, but uh, we're gonna learn about the book, but more importantly, I think we're gonna learn about uh, how to apply the narratives that are in the book to some contemporary issues. Uh, we're in the midst uh, right now in the world of a whole bunch of specific crises that we all wrestle with every day, war, inflation, COVID, pandemic, political polarization, uh, at least in the United States. Uh, I think sometimes it's useful to take a step back from all of that uh, and focus on the bigger picture, uh, who we are, where we're going, how we're going to get there. Uh, and this session is kind of uh, about that. Uh, our presenters are going to apply their big picture, which is the globalization narratives that they'll be describing uh, to some current events and particularly to Russia and Ukraine. They've authored an important new book, which I just showed you, Six Spaces of Globalization. It's about narratives, the different ways that we look at the global economy and how those narratives inform policy. The problems that we have to deal with in the real world uh, seem right now to be intractable, which means I don't think we're gonna solve them uh, today in this single event or perhaps we can leave this session with a better understanding uh, of how we can deal with them going forward. We're gonna begin with a slide presentation of the book, uh, followed by a conversation with the authors. And then there will be time after that for questions uh, from the audience. Uh, I will remind you about that later, but what you do is go back to the event page for this session, look for the button that says, uh, that says ask live questions, click on that, ask your question and through a mysterious technological process, uh, it will end up with me and I will be able to ask your question later on. So we have two authors and we're fortunate to have them both with us. Uh, Anthea Roberts is professor in the School of Regulation and Global Governance at Australia National University uh, and is the author of Is International Law International? A great title. And uh, I admire her, uh, her uh, fortitude, I guess, because she's coming to us from Australia at 6 a.m. her time. And so, Anthea, welcome and glad you're up. Uh, Nicholas Lamp is the Associate Professor in the Faculty of Law at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. And he was previously a dispute settlement lawyer at the WTO. Nicholas is coming to us uh, from Ontario. So he's in the, in the same time zone as, uh, as most of us and uh, I trust is therefore fully awake. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to the two authors to make a presentation with slides. And uh, Stefan, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Nicholas, I believe you're first. So let's go with you. Well, thank you so much for having us. Yes, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to talk about our, our book today. And I want to start by talking a little bit about how we started working on this book. The starting point for the book was the pushback against globalization that, that, that started around 2015, 2016, of course, with the election of Donald Trump in the United States, the Brexit uh, vote in the United Kingdom. And what we tried to do at that stage is really to understand these movements that were coming, coming to the fore. Because what we felt is that some of our uh, colleagues in the kind of economic establishment were too quick to dismiss some of the stories that these movements told. And so what we are trying to do in this book is to take a step back from the debate. And instead of trying to engage in the debate and, and telling you which narrative is wrong and which narrative is right, take a step back and try to understand each of the narratives on its terms and to understand the stories that they tell and also the values that these different narratives bring forward. So, so that's the first part of the book is this attempt to map and, and um, Anthea came up with this metaphor of the Rubik's Cube. It's like we have these debates, all these arguments are flying around. And what we're trying to do in the first part of the book is to unscramble that cube so that you can see the different faces of the cube uh, with more clarity. So what are the narratives that we present in the book? We start with the establishment narrative, which is this the, the view that we all grew up with in the uh, past 30 years, uh, the post-Cold War era, which is essentially, um, the basic message is essentially that globalization is beneficial to all. It's going to benefit us all in the end. Yes, some people are going to benefit more originally, but we can then use uh, domestic policies to redistribute the gains from globalization. And so there's this famous metaphor, famous met metaphor of uh, growing the pie. We can grow the pie and through globalization, and then everybody, everybody gets a bigger piece. And a crucial part of that story is the idea that 
all we need to do in order to benefit from globalization is to adjust, right? So if our job um, is of short, we can move to another uh, part of the country, take up another opportunity, and in the end, we're all going to be better off. That has been challenged in the past um, decades. First, from the left, in the wake of the global financial crisis, the Oc Occupy Wall Street movements and, and other left-wing populists ha have drawn attention to the fact that we have this yawning gap opening up between the rich and the rest. And so the basic argument here is that, well, it may well be that globalization helps us to grow the pie, but if all the gains from increased trade and investment are appropriated by the 1%, why why should we why should we want that right and so the argument is here that globalization doesn't work because the domestic economy is rigged to benefit uh, the top one percent and unless we fix the domestic economy this uh, this positive optimistic story about globalization that we've been hearing does not hold true then we have of course trump uh, the brexiteers on the right who say that actually there's something else going on it's not so much that that we have problems internally but we have been the globalization has allowed other countries such as uh, Mexico and China to take advantage of us and to steal all those good uh, manufacturing jobs that allowed us uh, to prosper. And I should say here that the framing for this narrative that we see here on the Economist cover is not the framing that proponents of this narrative would adopt. From the perspective of, of the establishment narrative, um, these people, the, the proponents of this narrative are often seen as the left behind by globalization. So we have to help them to catch up. Whereas proponents of the narrative really feel that they haven't been left behind. It's more that the world has gone in the wrong direction. And so they don't want to be, they want to, don't want to catch up. They want to change course and, 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 and restore that what, which has been lost. We have another narrative yet on the, also somewhat on the political right of the spectrum, though, although in the United States, it's now becoming a bipartisan consensus very quickly. And this is basically that globalization um, has allowed China to overtake or at least catch up with the United States in important respects. And, uh, and, and that, that is a dangerous thing. And, and the, the reason why it's dangerous is because China it cannot be trusted. China is a foe. And if you have um, deep economic interdependence with a strategic foe, you are incredibly vulnerable uh, to sabotage, to espionage, um, and to the weaponization of that interdependence. And so what the United States has to do is to recover some, some measure of independence from China in order to be able to confront China effectively. There's yet another narrative on the, on the left of the political spectrum, which says that we, if we just look at the domestic economy or just look at competition between countries, we miss the real story. And the real story here is that we're not dealing with competition between countries primarily, we're dealing with uh, tr competition between transnational classes, right? On the one hand, you have the corporations who are able to move around the globe uh, without any barriers, can, can produce wherever it's cheapest, can export anywhere without uh, any tariffs and can use that liberty to play off workers in different countries against each other. And not just the workers who are, have to accept lower benefits and lower wages, but also governments who are um, in a competition uh, through lower tax rates uh, for investment. And so on this view, who is ultimately gaining are really the, the, the corporations, whereas workers in all countries, uh, not just in developed countries, are losing out. And finally, we have the view that all these debates about who wins and loses are like fighting over the deck chairs on the Titanic while the entire ship is going down. And the argument here is that uh, that globalization, as it's currently uh, conceived, will all drive us off, off the cliff because our economic model is simply unsustainable. Um, we have uh, glo through globalization, Western patterns of production and consumption have been uh, have been diffused throughout the globe which has led to skyrocketing carbon emissions. So if the establishment talks about um, a hockey stick of global prosperity that has brought us up, this narrative highlights that there's also a hockey stick of global carbon emissions that is, uh, that is potentially creating a lose-lose uh, scenario for all of us. And we just have to look to what's happening in India at the moment uh, to see how real the threat described by this narrative is. So what we end up with is this diamond structure where, where we have a very positive, optimistic win-win narrative on the top, which is essentially what we where we come from, then we have these competing win lose narratives in the middle, and at the bottom we have the the gloomy lose lose perspective. So I'll pick up here to ask: now that we've sort of unscrambled the Rubik's cube to identify what these different narratives are and how they relate to each other, we wanted to give you a few illustrations about how you can use this to analyze 
uh, contemporary debates. And we're going to give a few examples from the book and also, as Bill suggested, a few that have come out since the book. So one that we have in the book is the idea of strategic switching, which is the ability for um, various strategic actors to be able to deliberately try to switch the face of the Rubik's Cube from one narrative that is less helpful to them to another narrative that is more helpful to them. Now, the example I'm going to give here is when Zuckerberg was taken before the US Congress for testimony and a reporter photographed his notes before he went in. And on its no his notes, it said, if they ask you about breaking up Facebook, tell them you can't do that because then China will win. So what we can see here is that as a representative of Facebook, it's so a big tech, he's being taken in before Congress. And the concern here is very much a corporate power narrative that Facebook has too much power. And so the US as a regulator needs to do things to curb in Facebook's power in order to protect the little guy, the consumer. What Zuckerberg is saying is that's entirely the wrong narrative. Really what we need to be looking at is this international competition between Team USA and Team China. And this is a battle for the technological future. Now in this, we know that because of civil military fusion, Team China is working together with their corporations, their citizens, their government. And so we also need to, on Team US, realize that we are all on the same team, whether it's the US government, US consumers and US companies. It's us against them. At this point, we then see scientists all around the world who are horrified by these geoeconomic developments of us versus them and say, if we want to work collectively for some of our collective problems, dealing with some of the global threats like climate change or pandemics, then we need to recognize that we are all on planet Earth together. And unless we work together, we will not be able to solve these global threats. So we can see here this kind of switching happening in the media. We can also see a movement in policies. And what we have noticed is that quite often some of the new policies that are coming up are not supported by a single narrative, but they're actually supported by different narratives for different reasons, leading to overlaps and alliances. Now, the example I'm going to give you here is about national self-reliance when it comes to reshoring man semiconductor manufacturing. And this is something that we have seen has become more popular in, in the last year in the US, in China and in the EU. And this is something that we would have predicted from the book, though it, though it um, postdates the book, because this policy is supported by at least three narratives. So on the one hand, particularly in the US, you have the right-wing populist narrative, which really wants to build capacity in domestic manufacturing. And that includes in semiconductors, though it would include manufacturing much more broadly. We also have what we think of as one of the global threats narrative, which is a real emphasis on resilience, which we saw particularly after COVID. And here the motivation is very much to ensure supplies and capacity in essential sectors. Now, one of those essential sectors is clearly PPE, as we saw in COVID. But for our modern economy, another essential sector is going to be semiconductor manufacturing. Finally, we can also see a geoeconomic narrative, which is really about that strategic competition. And here the motivation is that you want to build capacity in strategically important areas like semiconductors, but you also don't want to be reliant on a geopolitical foe. So we can see the US doesn't want to be reliant on China, China doesn't want to be reliant on the US, and the EU is trying to work out whether it can be not reliant on either of them. What we see here is that at the overlap, all three of these narratives would actually be supportive of the idea of reshoring semiconductor manufacturing. And that's the movement we're seeing in all of these jurisdictions. But we can also see some where two narratives overlap, but not with a third. And the example that I'm going to give here is the cause to diversify your supply lines through ally shoring. So here you're, you're getting together with a bunch of your allies and working out reshoring not into your own state, but into their state. Now, this would work if your primary concern is resilience or if your primary concern is the geoeconomic narrative of making sure you're not reliant on a strategic flow. But if your primary concern is the right wing populist desire to bring manufacturing back home, the fact that you might bring it back home to your friends doesn't count. You want to bring it back home to yourself. And so we can start to use these narratives to pass some of the debates and see what policies they prefer and when it might be that you have a policy that multiple narratives prefer, even if for different reasons. Now, one of the questions that we were asked going into this is, what are we seeing happening as a result of the Russia-Ukraine conflict? And so I'm going to sketch a few different ideas we have with that, but I'm sure that we'll do more of this in the debates. So one of the things that's very clear in the Russia-Ukraine conflict is that we have had a real um, movement out or expansion of the geoeconomic narrative. 
Now, the geoeconomic narrative is very much about a security sensibility going to the heart of the economic, the idea that economic security is national security. In the book, we focused attention on where it had been most prevalent, which is in the China versus US story, even though we acknowledge that it could be broader than that. But what we see in the Ukraine uh, conflict is it has really widened in two different ways. So the first way, it has really widened its focus in the geoeconomic narrative, not just from China, but from China to include Russia. And here we can see after Russia's invasion and the, and the friendship between Russia and China, we've seen an extraordinary pushback in terms of economic sanctions from the West, really an unprecedented pushback. And in many ways, the West is seeking to decouple much more completely and much faster from Russia than it has from China. And so on one side of the equation, China and America, we are now seeing China and Russia against America. So it has broadened in that way. But the other way that it has broadened is I think it has really led to more of a sea change in the sentiments in, in Europe. What we can see, particularly in movements throughout Europe, but in, in Germany is one of the most obvious examples, we're seeing a much stronger consciousness of the geoeconomic narrative, not just about Russia, but also potentially about China. And so we're seeing a bit of a sea change happening in Europe about the prevalence of this securitization of the globalization debate. Now, where we see this the most obviously is obviously in European reliance on Russian gas. And here we can start to see a similar thing, which is that there are increasing calls to reduce reliance on Russian gas. And again, this can be understood as actually pulling together a coalition of different actors who support it based on different narratives. Now, the most obvious narrative to start with here are the people that call for <coughs> reducing reliance on Russian gas because they don't want to be paying for Russia's um, war chest and they want to actually undermine Russia as a strategic foe. And so if you were able to cut off the gas, that would make you not reliant and it would also mean you weren't fueling the, the Russian war machine. This narrative is slightly different to what we see in the global threat to resilience narrative, where there's just a broader call to diversify your energy needs. And the level of concentration that has been happening on Russian gas presents a real problem for diversification because it leaves you vulnerable if a country like Russia wanted to cut off supplies. And it's also increasingly overlapping <coughs> with the other global threats narrative that we identify, which is a sustainability narrative. So people are saying, look, this is really the opportunity to get off carbon heavy fuels and embrace clean energy. And all of this can happen by reducing reliance on Russian gas. But we're also seeing in Europe that there are very different views on what lesson they should be drawing from uh, the Russia-Ukraine situation. And this could have very significant uh, implications for globalisation going forward. So just to sketch that out, you would have some people that think that the lesson that you draw from this war is that you can't trust Russia. And so you need to exclude as much as possible Russia from the globalisation debates and from the global economy. Now, that would see, allow globalisation to largely continue, but with a bracketing of Russia. That is the least disruptive answer to how you could understand the, the precedent to draw. A broader precedent, which some are uh, suggesting, and I think is stronger in the US, but more of a question mark in Europe, is whether the precedent isn't that you can't trust Russia, but is actually that you can't trust authoritarian regimes. And this one seeks to broaden the circle. So instead of just wanting to decouple more from Russia, you'd also want to decouple more from other authoritarian regimes like China. And this is something that we, we hear a lot in US debates, and we're hearing more but not as strongly in European debates. It's still a real question mark. And the final one is actually to learn the lesson that you might be able to not trust anyone. And that would actually include uh, allies like the US. Now, this is one that we don't hear much in Europe at the moment, because in the banding together on Russia and in the question mark on China, we're increasingly seeing this transatlantic alliance of the best buds. But imagine in a couple of years, if someone like, if Donald Trump or someone like him gets back into um, office in the United States, we could well see Europe increasingly coming to the view that what's happening in, in the US is, is so disturbing to them in terms of the politics and in terms of approaches to alliance that really they can't rely on anyone. And if we think back to things like semiconductors, this makes a difference as to whether or not you want to effectively do uh, an allied cooperation between the US and Europe on things like semiconductors, or really the Europe will want to be that we can't rely on anybody and that includes not relying on the United States. The final point we would note 
is it's always important to see not just uh, different narratives within Western debates, and ours has been very much a focus on Western debates, but also how those narratives do or do not translate into the rest of the world. And here we just put up a, a, a graphic from Business Today, which is uh, who is not taking sides in the Russia-Ukraine situation and which countries have not imposed sanctions. And what we can see here is you've got Russia identified there by its flag, white, blue and red. But then we can see that it is Europe, it is um, the North Atlantic, uh, Canada, US, it is the five eyes, it includes um, Australia here, not, not New Zealand. But a large part of this graph is grey, and that's because many countries are choosing not to take sides in this. And this reminds us of one of the narratives that we identified from outside the West that has a much longer lineage, which is a sort of a neo-colonial narrative that really is not particularly supportive of Western ideas on globalisation because they see it as exploitative. And what we see here is potentially the development of a kind of a non-aligned movement or a strategically autonomous uh, zone within the world economy and what, what that might mean going forward. We're going to leave the presentation there. Uh, this is the book, as Bill said, and we look forward to hearing comments and discussion. So thank you. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much. Thank you very much for, uh, for all of that. Uh, let me start with kind of a um, political question, uh, which is not a US centric question, but one to think about. Uh, what you're really talking about is is uh, globalization under duress or globalization under threat or globalization in decline. I think people will debate whether or not that's actually happening, but let's let's assume that it's under pressure at least. <clears throat> uh, can you say that, or would you say that the decline, if you will, or the pressure of globalization uh, has led to the collapse of the political center in uh, many countries, or is it vice versa? Is the center disappearing because globalization is disappearing or is globalization disappearing because our political center is disappearing? That's a great question. Nicholas, do you want to go first or me? Yeah, so I, I, I think the survival of the center really depends on its ability to, to take into um, to, in, to integrate these critiques that have been brought forward into change in response. I mean, for example, in, in to take the take the German example, uh, we we just had a few uh, elections in which the, the fringes have actually been losing out um, partly in response to the to the Ukraine war because they, they weren't weren't willing to articulate um, a, a clear position to what's happening in Russia. But more broadly, um, people like uh, Joe Biden and uh, in the United States or, or Scholz have made a conscious attempt to understand where the critiques are coming from and, and to try to, to bring them on board. And you see that in, in the trade sphere in the United States, uh, most broadly with the, with the protections turn that the Biden administration has taken, but also its attempt to integrate concerns about climate, concerns about inequality, concerns about worker well-being into its platform. Then there's a separate question of how successful it is, but I don't think that it, the, the, these critiques prejudge the decline of the center. They're really they're posing a challenge to the center to to um, kind of get out of its old um, habits of mind and, and and develop a more integrative uh, vision of of what it should be doing in terms of its economic policy. And well, just to, just to add to that, I think um, a part of part of what happened before is there was such a strong consensus of the center, center left and center right, in favor of the establishment narrative that I think it actually quietened voices on the further left and the further right. What we're seeing is that those are now bubbling up because they weren't sufficiently heard before. And so the question is, do you go to those polls? which often is the first thing that happens, but then what do you reintegrate back into the center? So I think one of the interesting things, and Nicholas referred to this, is to, for example, the, the approach to China. Really, I think the, the geoeconomic approach to China started much more strongly on the right, but has really changed what's now much more of a center policy. So we see it actually as, as quite fluid and movable. Well, what you're kind of saying, I think, is that what Biden and, and Schultz, so your two examples are trying, you, basically you're saying they're trying to preserve the center, uh, which they perceive, perceive as under attack. Is that a fair statement? But but pre preserved through actual, in some cases, substantive modification. So they still want to own the center, but the center itself may need to change for them to do that. So they're preserving through co-option. Yes. Well, okay. That, um, Interesting. Let me ask you a related question. 
here we have these narratives, and I think people that have listened to the presentation can see the, the narratives are very much there. And we can all identify, at least in the United States, politicians that are uh, exponents of particular of, of each of the narratives. Uh, have, they, have the narratives always been there, or are they just coming out more strongly right now? Uh, and if so, why? So I think if you look at any particular country and any particular time, you will see narratives. But what we see is some of them rising and falling at different times. So, for example, the strongest narrative that you would have seen in the West that was a challenge to globalization before was probably the narrative that was the uh, corporate power narrative. And we saw that back um, when you had the battle against Seattle and a very strong concern about environmental standards and labor standards. That then actually quietens down for quite a few years while you have the Iraq war and the Afghanistan war and really only starts to sort of rear its head again after, after the global financial crisis when you get a much stronger focus then on inequality again in the West and also more recently on corporate power. So we see, for example, that narrative kind of has been before, dies down and comes back with renewed vigour. Other ones like the geoeconomic narrative, there have always been people that have had concerns about um, the level of trading with China, but that one has really risen in the last few years and so and has and has sort of broadened its appeal a lot. So I think that what we're going to see is that different narratives um, come to the fore at different times and take precedence at different times. Why is that happening now? So I tend to think of this using complex systems thinking, which is that often you see um, a system where even though there is pressure underneath and you see movement for change and change, actually nothing looks like it's happening for a very long time. And then suddenly it boils over and everything happens at once. So the reason that Nicholas started with the pushback against economic globalization in 2016 with the US um, vote for Trump and then also Brexit is that there had actually been a lot of concerns percolating for a long time that hadn't been sufficiently listened to. And that was at the point at which they sort of bubbled over and we saw them sort of come much more to the centre of political debates. Nicholas, did you want to add to that? Yeah, so one, one thing that we try to do in the book is to, to identify the basic structure of these narratives, like um, who loses, who, who wins, right? That's, that's one of the subtitles of the book. And of course, these um, these narratives come to the fore at different times in different incarnations. They're, they're different arguments, different examples, you have different protagonists. But but we do believe that that you will always find uh, um, narratives with this, this particular structure, both going back in time in the past. So for example, uh, the corporate power narrative is a very Marxist, has a very Marxist flavor. Um, you would find many of the arguments made by the ge ge economic narrative in, in realist uh, thinking uh, going back quite a bit. And and um, but also in the future, I don't think even if particular protagonists uh, exit the stage, these kinds of arguments I think we are going to be with us. And it's really a question of what is the balance of power between these different uh, narratives. And just a final comment on you said that the center is co-opting uh, these um, narratives that are coming to challenge it. I think it's also actually a learning process, um, yes. a, a genuine learning process. It's not just strategic co-option. I do think they're. Um, if you look at the Biden administration, um, the, the German government, they, they generally feel that they, there's, they've learned that they were wrong to some extent. Agree. Well, you led, yes, except that if you go back to one of your slides, ones with the creating the Venn diagram with the circles and, and the, the intersection of, you know, which uh, some various policies that, that actually uh, uh, conformed with multiple narratives. Uh, I mean, it seems to me that that uh, what any good politician is going to do is precisely that, uh, is to look for answers that are going to uh, accommodate the views of the largest number of people. Uh, so if you can produce policies that are comfortable for multiple narratives, you're better off than if you're simply taking one and running with it. So, I mean, one of the questions that we, we get asked a lot about these narratives is, are they genuinely held or are they strategic? And the answer is that they are often both and different actors may be relying on them to different amounts. What we wanted to do here is look at the more um, sort of genuine motivation behind the different narratives because we think that there are many people that genuinely support different narratives. But we also wanted to identify that some actors can be using them strategically. So the example I gave, obviously, of the strategic switching was a corporate actor, but you could imagine many politicians doing exactly what you said, which is using these quite strategically. But the reason we didn't want to focus in on just the strategic use is, I guess, twofold. 
The first is it's not always obvious whether something is a strategic use or a good faith use. And so it's a, it puts us into a, an awkward position of trying to suggest that or prove that, which is very, very difficult and tends to be highly partisan. But the second, and I think this one is important, I think what often happens is when you're convinced of your own narrative, you think, how am I right and how are they wrong? And often when you think, how are they wrong? You think, look, they are, they are stupid or bad actors, like they just don't get it. Or you think that they have been sort of, um, sort of under the sway of malevolent politicians that are sort of using, for example, cultural ideas to overplay the fact that, that people in various parts of the country have not had their standard of living improved. And so you think, look, the real problem with right-wing populism is that they don't have enough money and we need redistribution, which the left is happy with. It's not really that there are different values or cultural issues at stake. And one of the things we wanted to say is actually, instead of assuming that people are acting in bad faith or that they're stupid, why don't we take an empathetic approach that assumes that there is something in each of these narratives? And at least the process that we found in doing this was that we became convinced that there really was a genuine concern in each of the narratives that you did need to listen to if you wanted to kind of move forward. You didn't always have to agree with it, but it wasn't just a case that some narratives were right and some were wrong. In fact, we came to the position that all of them were a bit right and all of them were a bit wrong, which means that if we have a political debate that tends to be characterised by here's how I'm right and here's how you're wrong, it means that somebody on another narrative can also equally feel justified by saying here's how I'm right and here's how you're wrong. And so we want to move people into a way of thinking which asks not just how are you right but asks how are you wrong? And when they're thinking about other narratives, not just to think how are those other narratives wrong but in what ways are those other narratives right? So I think that there's genuine motivation and there's strategy and there will be a combination of the two, but I think it would be an error to reduce it all to strategy. Well, uh, <clears throat> five of the six narratives are, <clears throat> I guess, could best be described as trade skeptical, uh, emphasizing the, the negative consequences of, of trade uh, for very you know, different reasons, but the, the, the bottom line is that we're nervous about trade. How do you square those narratives with polling data, at least in the United States, that pretty consistently shows a large percentage of the American population supporting trade and supporting trade agreements. Apart from the right-wing populist narrative, the Trumpist one, I wouldn't say that they, the other narratives are necessarily skeptical of trade per se. I think they're more skeptical of how trade has been done. And, 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 and so what they're trying to change is our priorities in how we do uh, trade. So to take, for example, the, the corporate power narrative you don't really see from that narrative a strong pushback against trade saying like we shouldn't be trading with other countries shouldn't be trading with mexico with china but saying if we trade with mexico we also have to make sure that uh, workers in mexico uh, benefit from the trade so we have to include strong labor provisions in those trade agreements which then will of course then also redound to the benefit of uh, workers in the united states and canada because they face less wage pressure, right? Um, similarly, from the geoeconomic narrative, you don't see a blanket rejection of trade with China because it's a very different question whether you trade uh, soybeans and toys with China than if you allow a Huawei to invest to build your 5G network. So um, I, I guess what, what the, uh, the message that the other narratives are sending is not so much be skeptical of trade, but rather um, be skeptical of, of uh, doing trade at all costs. We have to be attentive to other other values and concern in designing our trade agreements. Well, let me ask, I think, uh, go ahead out there. Right. I was just going to say that I think where we're getting to on that is we, we're not believers that there was globalization and there will now be deglobalization. Instead, we think of it more as what we think of as variegated globalization, which is we're going to see globalization walked back in some sectors on some rationales much more than in others. So we've already seen a clear bifurcation not just with respect to the internet in some ways, but also with 5G, and we're going to see increasing pressures on that with things that involve data. But that is very different, as Nicholas says, to trading in things that are non-essential, not data heavy, like toys. And we're going to see, so one of the things we would want to map out going forward is the different logics on how you could reform different trade agreements, but also the idea that globalization may happen on different areas at different speeds. I guess the one other thing to say is that from our perspective, this kind of pushback and skepticism about globalization, um, I think you're seeing that, and you're absolutely right, five of the narratives in the Western debates 
are skeptic narratives. So they're pushing back against what had been a very, very strong orthodoxy of the establishment narrative. And that establishment narrative will continue to be a very, very strong player in the debates, even if it's got these various attacks from different sides, because it hasn't been replaced by any of them. Um, and so it, it's still very, very much present in the debates. But what we saw when we looked around the world is that narrative of the establishment narrative is much stronger in some other parts of the world. And so, for example, if you look at opinion polls in Asia on globalisation, they're, they're much more positive than they are in the West. And so one of the things that we would always seek to remind people of is that the dominance of these narratives in the current Western debates does not mean that they're dominant across the world. Well, I'm glad you said that because that, that preempts one of my questions. And uh, actually this conversation has been about two of them. It sounds like I was going to ask you if you see any hope uh, for the establishment narrative, which is the only one that's win-win. Uh, and you seem to be saying, yes, there is hope. Well, let me yes. ask, then let's let's take that that thought, that's which is a happy thought, uh, and apply it to uh, US policy for the moment for the moment. Uh, the Biden administration has articulated a US trade policy, a trade policy for the workers, a trade policy for the middle class. They haven't been overly specific yet about exactly what that means. Uh, which narrative do, do you think that fits into? I would say it's uh, it's probably the corporate power narrative, right? This idea that um, globalization has been benefiting the global the, the corporations uh, and the rich, and now we have to recenter the worker. But of course, and to link this to your questions about the establishment narrative, well, the question is always which worker. Uh, and and the, for for the Trump administration, that was very clear: the steel worker, the the auto worker, like the old style manufacturing worker. Who, who embodies this masculine ethos of, 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 of America. Whereas there was some hope, I think, that with the Biden administration, it would be more inclusive conception of workers. So if you talk about solar panels, you're not just talking about people manufacturing the solar panels, you're also talking about the service sector workers who are installing the solar panels, right? And suddenly it becomes much more difficult. And I think there is the hope for the establishment narrative that it can really say, look, look, actually free trade is here still the best option because it allows, creates the most jobs in solar panel um, installation uh, sector, if you compare what's uh, the jobs that you're trying to save in the uh, solar panel manufacturing sector. And so, so I think it's probably the corporate power narrative. What, what the Biden administration hasn't really figured out is how to articulate and really confront these trade-offs between different concerns that are brought forward by the different narratives. That's an interesting example, because right now we're in the middle of a public debate here precisely about solar panels. Um, and the debate really is about pursuing an investigation where um, the Chinese have allegedly tried to circumvent our, our laws. Uh, and the, if that view prevails, then it will prevail in favor of the uh, manufacturers at the expense of the installers, uh, although there are a lot more installers. So this may be a case where it's uh, uh, the Biden administration may be forced in the end to choose between which set of workers you want to accommodate. But um, let me, uh, let's pursue this one more step. If, you're, if it is the corporate narrative, then what you're really talking about is complaints that the benefits of trade are maldistributed. They're going to the rich people and they're not going to the workers. How could trade policy by itself redistribute global benefits? So this is a really interesting question. And I think one of the things that we're seeing when we talk to trade policy um, uh, people from different countries is some of them have a feeling of like, well, how am I meant to deal with this? And, and it could be redistribution, but it could also be environmental concerns or, or various other concerns. And they have a feeling of like, we're overloading the trade boat with all these different things. It's hard enough to get agreements already. How can I actually seek to get agreements with others if we add in all these other concerns? And also, do I even have authority for that? But I think one of the things that we would say to that is that the establishment narrative is based on a very particular configuration of, of our economies, which largely assumes that trade policy happens at the international level. And there we seek to um, get agreement and, and um, make sure that we sort of grow the size of the pie. And then we can leave to the domestic level all of these other concerns. And I think what we're actually seeing now is a real challenge to that, a real challenge to the idea that you can do something cleanly at the international and then come back and deal with everything at the domestic level. Because we're seeing that that domestic level just was not happening in a way that was inclusive, was not happening in a way that got people on board. And so now the ability to go back and do that stuff at the international level depends and is conditioned on getting more support at the domestic level. So that's 
reconfiguring our understanding of the domestic and the international in various ways. Now, there are some scholars that are looking at ways that you might do this, where you might condition trade policy on having certain redistributive effects, or uh, um, and so there may be legal ways you can do it, but I actually just think as a matter of politics, you're increasingly not going to get the buy-in from different states unless you address some of these domestic concerns. And so this idea that you could do it internationally and then deal with it domestically, I think is just going to be transfigured in, in the next generation of these debates. Just to mention one concrete example of what the Biden administration can do, in fact, has already done, is I think the minimum tax deal, right? So, so the OEC minimum tax deal that the Biden administration negotiated is an attempt to kind of rebalance uh, the, the bargaining power as between corporations and governments, right? So, so that governments, there's a limit, there's a floor to how much, how far corporations can drive down corporate tax rates in different countries. And so this is a very concrete example where, where, the, where the Biden administration can say, we can't just open open up the, the borders and, and let globalizations that go anywhere, that, um, sorry, corporations go anywhere they want. We have to make sure that we preserve the bargaining power of both of workers and of governments. And so that's a very concrete example where uh, you can have a policy with distributive effects negotiated at the international level to counterbalance trade liberalization. Well, yeah, but that's a policy where you're taking benefits away from big corporations and giving them to the government. You're not giving them to the workers necessarily, right? That's true, but that will then cash out um, the idea that will then allow the government hopefully to invest in it infrastructure. Opens, yes it creates the opportunity for the government to pursue a policy that would do that but that would not be a the redistribution part of that would not be a trade policy uh but you could lower do for taxes example, or something like that you could do something like from the usmca and, and nicholas uh did the chapter on this in the book where you might sort of change the minimum uh wage that's applicable under certain trade agreements or you may be only allowed to buy products where a certain percentage of them were done under a certain minimum wage. Now, in some ways, that can be a protectionist attempt to bring more work back on shore to the US, but in another way, it can also be one about um, protecting workers in places like Mexico. That's one where you build in to the trade policy something about uh, location of where work is done and the amount of money being paid for that work that will have redistributive effects directly. That's a good example. In fact, when, when we looked into exactly this question, um, that was the only one that I could think of, basically changing the rules of origin, which is something that you do in a trade negotiation uh, to produce a redistributive, a redistributive outcome. Uh, actually, just a brief commercial here, the, the Scholl Chair did a study on this a couple of years ago, looking at the change rules that you were just referred to. And because, and I think it's, you, you, don't, you can never be sure about other people's motivations, but you can look at the effects. I think we expect that it will have the effect of, of uh, reshoring jobs uh, back into the United States. It could have the effect of raising the minimum wage in Mexico, uh, at least for automobile workers. This is a, a change that only affected that one industry. So it could have that effect. Uh, it will most likely have the effect of bringing jobs back here. The consequence of that, we concluded, was that it will also make the US industry uh, less competitive globally. Uh, so there are, there are trade-offs. Um, let me, uh, we've got uh, some uh, audience questions accumulating, which is good. So let me, before I turn to them, and let me remind you the audience, there's still time to ask questions. So add a few more to the pile and we will get to them uh, in a minute. Uh, you did mention in passing in your book, some other narratives, um, the neo-colonial narrative, the Asia rising narrative, anti-West. Do uh, you wanna comment at, briefly on any of those or do you wanna just stick with the main six? Um, I'm happy to do those. One of the things that we did in this um, book is we were really looking at, at the pushback against economic globalisation that was happening in the West. And we thought these six main narratives really helped to capture the outlines of those debates. But what we wanted to remind readers is, of course, those, those narratives we may see elsewhere, but we may be seeing other narratives elsewhere that are downplayed in the domestic, in the US debates. And so we identified four, not because that they're exhaustive, but just to give a sense of the differences in some of those narratives. Uh, the first is the neo-colonial narrative, which is really a pushback that says that trade has been used in an extractive way where the global north and particularly the transnational capitalist class have been able to exploit trade at the benefit to, to their benefit and at the expense of the global south. And we see that very much in critiques from India, from Argentina, from Brazil. Uh, that is quite different to what we think of as various Asia rising narratives. 
And the Asia Rising narratives, which can be about Asia in general, about the sort of giants of India and China, about China specifically, the Chinese dreams, these are actually narratives that instead of seeing developing states as being downtrodden from the trading system, actually see them as, as great beneficiaries, also through their hard work, but through the opportunity. And we've seen an extraordinary rise in living standards in Asia that's been unmatched by elsewhere through this period of economic globalization. And this is an interesting one to think about. If you think about the protectionist narrative about the relocation of manufacturing and the devastating effects that has had, that's really that story of relocation of manufacturing as told from the losers. Whereas the Asia rising narrative, which looks at the growth of the middle class in Asia and these beautiful new gleaming cities, is really the same story, but told from the side of the winners. Then we have the against Western hegemony narrative. And this is one where you see China and, and Russia really coming together to say that the West is hegemonic and hypocritical. And that's one in many ways, which is the flip side of the geoeconomic narrative. So the geoeconomic narrative that very much sees um, security and the security concern of the authoritarian uh, regimes. What we see with China and Russia is they also have security concerns that are inflecting their policies, but those are about the abusive power that the West has had given its role in, in the global economy uh, with concerns about things like SWIFT and sanctions. And finally, what we see is um, in, in Africa and places like that, many countries that really haven't um, advanced as, as much in this globalization era. And the question is really, will they be able to sort of follow the lead of those in Asia and really be able to climb their way up the globalization chain? Or are they likely to be um, subject to another form of neocolonialism, but this time by, by Chinese investors rather than Western investors? And this just gives a bit of a sense in a more global way of the different narratives that are around there. there are, there's no one narrative that defines any country. There are differences of perspective within all of them, and it creates a more kaleidoscopic view of globalization. Let's go to the questions from the audience now, uh, because we've got uh, a number of them. And then if we've run out, I have uh, I have a few more. The first one is this. It seems that the six narratives have true and false components. Which one better describes the globalization for the world right now? Well, I think um, the, the you're absolutely right. There, there are wrong aspects or and, and um, correct aspects in each of them. And it's really not, we're not in a position to say that one is the best description. Some of them have make claims that we can sh can be shown to be empirically false. But but for a, a large part of the narratives, it, it's really about telling the story in a different way, highlighting different aspects, highlighting different protagonists. And so it, it's it just because it's really a question of value, a normative question, which aspect do you think is more weighty, or which one is more important, right? So do you care more about the fact that you can have, have can accumulate more material wealth? Or do you care more about the fact that you might be poorer, but you have your job in your community uh, where your father and grandfather have also worked, right? So those are the questions of value. And so it's, in, it's impossible to objectively say that one perspective is correct, uh, whereas the other one isn't. Okay, the next one is, if the author, this is an interesting one, because we haven't really talked about this. If the authors are correct, what does it mean for the multilateral institutions, such as the WTO, WIPO, World Health Organization, ILO, and the UN? Well, I mean, so, and let's go on the WTO. But just on the WTO, I think it poses a very difficult uh, challenge for the WTO because the establishment narrative um, kind of supercharged the, the trade negotiations, not only because it was a very positive view of, of liberalization, but also because of this um, division of labor that Anthea mentioned earlier between the international level where you grow the wealth and then the distributive politics that happens at the domestic level, right? So that allowed trade negotiators to engage in, in reciprocal exchange of trade concessions at the multilateral level and then um, say, okay, our domestic politicians are going to deal with, with the fallout. Now that trade policy is being asked to address all these substantive issues directly, like climate, um, inequality, worker rights, all these substantive concerns are being brought into a forum which really can't handle it because there's no substantive agreement ever to be found in the WTO on issues such as uh, labor rights or, or other, other distributive concerns. And so it's, it's telling that that the one negotiation that is multilateral negotiation that's still happening in the WTO on fishery subsidies is this one kind of small topic area where there is actually something approaching 
a universal um, agreement on, on a substantive policies issues. But as soon as we get beyond that, maybe to fossil fuel subsidies or even labor rights, such an agreement cannot be obtained. And so uh, the, the role of these institutions will be a different one. I think it will be more to, to, um, to as a forum for negotiate these, these conflicts, but the idea that we're going to be able to um, to make substantive law in the way that has been done in previous decades is, is probably um, out of the question, at least in the case and of the WTO. Just, and let me just sort of follow up on that. I think that when you get international agreements, they, you often get them in one of two circumstances. The first is when you have very broad agreement on something. So many, many countries want to come on board for something. But the other is when you don't necessarily have broad agreement, but you have concentrated power. And so we saw, for example, in the development of the WTA, a lot of that was really put forward by the concentrated power of the Quad, and it wasn't actually that a lot of other states necessarily agreed with it, but they needed to get on board because of the power dynamics. What I think we're seeing in the current uh, field is we're seeing differences of views. So we don't have the same broad agreement on, on various issues, and, and um, state subsidies would be one example, um, climate change would be another example. So we don't have that broad consensus. But we also don't have concentrated power. What we're seeing is a dispersion of power to a, to a more multilateral approach. And in some of these trade policy areas to a, a China and West kind of division on some of them. And both of those things suggest it's going to be much harder to have the heyday of the international institutions that we have seen uh, previously. I think that heyday of the 1990s where you had very strong international treaties and also institutions and legally backed dispute resolution was really part and parcel of either that broad agreement in the sort of post-Cold War moment, but also that concentrated power. And we're just not going to see it in quite the same way in this next era, I think. So power diffusion basically makes agreement somewhere between difficult and impossible to obtain, is what you're Power saying. diffusion when you've got differences of viewpoint. And on, on many of these core issues, we're going to have differences of viewpoint. And you see that very strongly with US and China, where many of the things that China's doing arguably are not a violation of the existing trade rules, but it would be very difficult to get uh, the US and China to agree on what new rules should be going forward, because the US would say one thing and China would say something else. So it's really that combination of different interests, different interests with diffuse power. Okay, the next one is, how do you incorporate into your explanation forced global cooperation made necessary by raw material concentrations in China? Yeah, I mean, this is this is going to be one of the real areas where we're seeing the movement of the geoeconomic narrative. So I think one of the first areas that you really saw the geoeconomic narrative come to a head was with 5G and infrastructure. And there we really started to think in this sort of technological age, a real focus, not just on infrastructure, but critical infrastructure. And that was one of the first early uh, points we saw about Huawei. But now what we're starting to see is conceptually, now that states are starting to take much more seriously these security concerns and what level of autonomy they might need to have, is we're starting to see the spread of that concept of what counts as critical. So we're seeing concerns about critical supplies, uh, critical minerals, critical technologies, critical infrastructure. And I don't think there's been that much work yet on what is this notion of criticality, but I think that's where the geoeconomic move is going to go because the geoeconomic move cannot be about deglobalizing and everything, then you need to have some ways to draw the line. And I think that this concept of criticality is going to be the way that that starts to happen and it starts to have a, have a core, but also move out. And I think we're still in an early, the early stages of that, but we see a similar dynamic happening, not just in infrastructure and investment screening, but in supply chain resilience and in critical minerals. I think something is gonna to come together around those ideas. Well, you see it really in, I think, particularly in your, uh, your narrative about China, because what you see in the United States is essentially the conflation of trade and security issues. And so when you say critical, people here say national security, but they mean the same thing. What do we have to have in order to defend ourselves against the perceived enemy? Yeah. Well, there's there's that, one that's other perspective. I mean, there's another perspective, which is uh, the, which has come to the fore during the pandemic, and that's the concept of resilience, uh, which we see as one of the global threats uh, narrative. So even if you're not necessarily concerned about China um, weaponizing the supply of critical minerals, like what about... What if there are well, demand shocks due to electric vehicles? Right? What if there are supply chain disruptions? And so you see everywhere a, a, a concern about well, um, a move from efficiency, like it's the most efficient way to just buy it from China, 
to its to its resilience. And so Canada is very actively uh, talking about the massive government um, investment or government backed investment that would be necessary to develop Canada's um, supply critical mineral supplies in order to counterbalance um, in order to create resilience at a minimum. Okay, let's move on to another interesting one. This is a, a Ukraine question, which I'm happy to have. How do you answer your question as to whether the war in Ukraine will mark the end of globalization? <clears throat> Could it be that the war, which has disrupted world food supplies and will have real adverse consequences in lots of countries, uh, could it be that that demonstrates that the world needs an open international trading system, which I guess by implication means uh, that we come back to the uh, the happy ending uh, establishment narrative? So I, one of the things that we've found as we've gone through this process is just how up and down all the different narratives are when you follow an event in real time. And we saw this also with COVID and China, where people originally were saying, this is terrible for China, this is going to be their Chernobyl moment. Then we had a, no, this is terrible for the West and China's pull through is going really well for China. And now we have a, no, it's terrible for China on the COVID zero policy. So I, I think we, we tend to be a little bit skeptical about like total end of end of history arguments because we see just in the period of writing this and, and, and then talking about the book how much people seem to go up and down uh, on these sorts of things. I do think that what you're actually seeing in, in Russia and Ukraine is you're seeing exactly the tension that suggests we're not going to get full globalization or full deglobalization. So the full globalization we had, which allowed the kind of economic and energy interdependence of Europe into Russia, has been shown to be very, very uncomfortable and awkward for Europe. And I think we're going to see a movement away from that. But you're quite right. The food shortages also show how much we rely on each other, right? Now, I don't think that that means that we snap back to a globalization where everything is open, but it may be that we snap back to some form of globalization uh, of certain products of the globe generally and other ones in various sorts of alliances. And so this is exactly what we're talking about where instead of one narrative winning and being right, we're going to see new dynamics come up that really take ideas and logics from different narratives and put them together. And that's why you may end up with this more variegated approach to globalization. You may want some things to just be domestic, you may want some things to just be with your friends, and you may want some things to be with enemy. Sorry, with with everybody, and you may want some things to be with everybody except for your enemies. And that kind of different set of logics may apply differently depending on the industry or product in question. Okay, to, if ahead, I add, can add to that. So it's it's really it's what was striking to us about um, working with these narratives that as soon as a new crisis comes up, you can almost predict the response that each of the narratives is going to have. So about the food crisis, you could tell from each of the narratives, you could tell a story about what this means. Like the protectionists would say, oh, this means we have to be self-reliant. Uh, the sustainability uh, people who are worried about climate change were saying, okay, these are the consequences of our meat consumption, because if you look at the uh, the, the grain that is grown in, in the US and Europe, it mostly goes into, into either uh, feedstock for, 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 for cattle or it goes into biofuels, right? And, and so instead of feeding the world. And so from each, from each of these perspectives, you can tell a story about what's wrong. Of course, the, the establishment narrative would say, well, look at India imposing export restrictions, that's going to make everything worse. So um, whatever crisis comes up, these different narratives will have some kind of response to it. Okay, we have just a couple of minutes left and we just have a couple of questions. Uh, the next one is younger Americans tend to support the concept of globalization in polling, but this is, which is what we have discussed before, but this is not translated into political support in the US for continued trade liberalization. How do you see this dynamic globally uh, and what would it take to rebuild support for trade liberalization moving forward? Is there any hope in other words? Well, in our experience, the anti-trade uh, element of the right-wing populist narrative is very uniquely U.S. Uh, maybe we see a bit with Le Pen in, in, in France, but even if you look at other right-wing populist movements in Europe particularly, they are not anti-trade. The Brexiteers are basically falling over themselves uh, to, to, in support of free trade. Uh, the AfD in Germany is, is has never said anything against uh, free trade. So it's, it's a, very, a very unique element of the United States uh, right-wing populist movement that you have the strong anti-trade movement. And we don't really know why that, why that is. Um, Anthea, I don't know whether you wanted to add to that. 
Yeah, no, I would actually say um, one of the ones where we saw the strongest generational differences was actually towards the global threats and sustainability narrative that we, we really saw the younger generations being much more concerned about climate change. But interestingly, the top of the cube, which is the win-win and the bottom of the cube, which has the climate change, which is the lose-lose, in one way they're different because one's win-win and one's lose-lose, but in another way that they're, they're similar because they're both globalist positions. So globalist, we have already have all the benefits or globalist, this is a global problem, we need to deal with it. And so I wonder if the youth are actually going to be part of that coalition, whereas the ones in the middle are much more sort of distributive domestic questions about who gets what, and they're much more zero-sum game. And so I think that there would be another way to think of the cube that aligns the top and the bottom in terms of going forward. And you can imagine many of the people that are both supportive of globalization for economic goals, would also be supportive of tempering some of those goals to ensure greater human well-being and greater climate change, Because, but they're all motivated by a globalist spirit. Okay, the last question, uh, I'm going to elaborate on, on myself, but the last question was how all this relates to climate change, which you've talked about a little bit, but it reminded me that at the end of the book, uh, you do suggest that all of these narratives may, be, be, may turn out to be kind of irrelevant as they're replaced by two new ones. One is the conf conflation of national security issues with economics uh, driven by China. And the other one is climate change and the existential consequences that that has for all of us. Uh, how do you see those two developments affecting your narratives? Are we going to have, are they going to be, are your six going to be replaced by new ones or are we just going to amend the old ones? Well, as yeah. Stephen said before, we, we often find that when you have a new crisis, these six narratives kind of reshuffle and, and give a different tractions on them. But we do see different ones coming to the fore more at different points. And I think our thinking has been that climate change is going to be an absolute wicked problem going forward, that US, China and geopolitical relations are going to be an absolute wicked problem going forward, and that the two in the next 10 years are going to completely collide as we try and do the clean energy uh, transition, because that's going to bring to bring to bear not just those two in contrast with each other, but many of these other concerns about protectionism, et cetera. And so we, we suspect that they will sort of reconfigure the narratives, not that the other narratives will go away, but there may be sort of a driving force that has these two as the drivers. And we think in particular, the interesting point will be the collision of these two and how that shakes out. And just to add, add to that, um, the argument we make in the final chapters of the book is that the climate crisis and the US-China competition are similar to globalization in that they're so complex and have so many aspects that you can't really understand them if you don't look at them through different lenses. And so the argument is that we make at the end is not so much that our narratives are going to be irrelevant or replaced, but rather that they are going to be talking about something different and uh, not so much globalization primarily, but about the climate crisis or US China competition but but we will we can again almost predict what kind of angle or what kind of aspect of these complex problems each of the narratives is going to highlight right so the left wing populists are going to highlight the inequality uh, how some people are living in uh, under under shade of trees where others have to labor in the sun um the um the the economic narrative is going to highlight how China benefits um, as opposed to the United States. And so, so each of these, um, the corporate power narrative is going to highlight how the corporations are uh, kind of uh, ignoring uh, climate change and, and are really the real enemies. So each of these narratives is going to reorient themselves around a new problem, but they're still going to be very much there. And we can, if we understand these narratives well, we can almost predict what their arguments are going to be about these new global challenges. Well, that's a good way to end. Um, I encourage everybody, take a look at the book, Six Faces of Globalization, Who Wins, Who Loses, Why It Matters. I think we've gotten some insight on that today. Thank you to both Anthea and Nicholas uh, for their comments and presentations and a very good discussion. And with that, we'll adjourn the session. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much you. for having us, Bill.